This episode is brought to you by Schwab. Do you ever think about your money? Sure you do. You probably think about it all the time. But guess what? Your money has been thinking about you, too. And it wants you to know that a financial plan can lead to 2.7 times higher net worth on average. That's why Schwab makes starting one easier than ever with one-on-one guidance from a financial consultant and a complimentary online retirement plan that you can start in as little as 15 minutes. Plus, track your progress with free digital planning tools. So what are you waiting for? Visit schwab.com slash plan today to learn more. Just a heads up, there's some swearing in this episode. Okay, here's the show. This TikTok says it's from inside an Alabama prison. It's a little hard to hear, but there's a filthy cell with what looks like mold and either dirt or feces all over the wall. Go in or get sprayed with mace, and they're going to drag me out. The user goes by at Aries Harris 81 and this video is just one of many that you can find on social media shot inside prisons on contraband cell phones. Say it, y'all. Report this. This video is hashtagged with Department of Justice. And when he says report this, I'm guessing the user means report it to the DOJ. But these kinds of videos have also made their way to a literal reporter, Carrie Blakinger. So one of the first times that someone reached out from a contraband cell phone was when they slid into my DMs posing as a young white lady. Oh, like that was their avatar? Yes, yes. And they and they acted like they were not a person in prison. Carrie gets these kinds of messages because she covers criminal justice and because her work tends to focus on incarcerated people as people, people who deserve to be heard. They were like, hey, I have some evidence of, you know, things that are happening in one particular unit, and I have video. And so then they send along the video. The video showed a darkened prison pod in Texas with smoke in the background and people screaming. Carrie realized it was shot with a contraband cell phone, but she still wasn't sure who had shared it with her. Maybe a friend or relative of someone in prison. And then as we kept going back and forth, I was like, wow, these answers are coming like really quickly. And and I realized eventually that this had to be the actual person in prison. This was not like a secondhand party communicating with them. And eventually they, they fessed up and admitted that. The person DMing Carrie is hardly the only one recording their prison experience. Over the past few years, contraband smartphones have given people behind bars a way to have entire lives online. This is a real live cell for you right here at prison. This ain't no scare straight program. This ain't no test. You come in here, you might not make it. Sometimes these videos, and these are from TikTok, or what's known as prison talk, are about showing hellish conditions. Sometimes they're about showcasing ingenuity. I done came up with making me like a little heater. Then what I do is I take some Vaseline, And then I put it in there and I put it on the side and it kind of burns like oil. Carrie saw enough of these videos and learned enough stories through DMs and texts that she knew she had the makings of a story, which she wrote for the Marshall Project. Eventually, I ended up with a large enough sampling of people that I talked to over time to realize that, you know, there's just a really diverse array of things that people do with their contraband phones. And I think the thing that actually inspired me to write a story about it was when I became aware of a group of a few, like like literally dozens of guys that were using a group messaging app to have a, you know, self-taught class using Harvard's CS50, their Computer Science 50 curriculum, to learn about, you know, computer programming. Today on the show, from computer science to side hustles to whistleblowing, Carrie takes us inside the world of contraband tech on the inside. 
I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick with us. This episode is brought to you by Charles Schwab. Schwab's passion for serving clients is more than standard practice. It's part of who they are. With transparent pricing, 24-7 live support, and a satisfaction guarantee, the people at Schwab go the extra mile to help you on your investing journey. They're not just financial people, they're people people too. Learn more at schwab.com slash why Schwab. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. I don't know if it's because she's an excellent reporter or because Carrie has shared details of her own time in prison, but it's clear that incarcerated people are comfortable telling her their stories. And in this case, after that first person slid into her DMs, Carrie collected story after story about what people are doing in prison with contraband cell phones. There's some guys that are using them to be in school. Sometimes they're taking online classes and just straight up posing as regular free world students and their professors might not even know what they're doing. Hmm. You know, some people do just, you know, stupid like TikTok dances and stuff. Some people write books and then self-publish them on Amazon and things. Uh, Some people sell their own artwork. There's one person I think that I, I talked to who used it to do ministry work when there was a lockdown and they weren't able to get out and do that sort of work in person. And, you know, there's some people who are in systems where the medical care is so pitiful that they're using WebMD to self-diagnose and then buying black market antibiotics accordingly to treat the problems because they can't actually get help from medical. There's another prison where... Apparently, the cell phone use was so brazen that sometimes the guys would call up front for help. Like they would call, the, you know, the the front office, be like, "Yo, send a guard back here. There's something going on." How are incarcerated people getting phones in the first place? I think that varies a little bit based on the specific facility. One of the main routes in a lot of places is through the staff. Because this is not the kind of thing that it's very easy for visitors to smuggle in. In a lot of situations, you know, you have to go through metal detectors. The actual visiting area doesn't necessarily allow for those kind of handoffs. When you're talking about something like smuggling and drugs, there's some chance sometimes that can come from visitors or through the mail, even though those are not the main routes. But when it comes to something like cell phones, visitors don't typically work as a reliable Root for it. So, so then it becomes that it's often staff, sometimes it's the guards, sometimes it's the civilian staff. And that's particularly true in, like, for instance, in Texas prisons. I think every instance that I'm aware of of, of people having contraband phones in Texas prisons has come from staff. Um, hmm. In theory, I think, you know, it could also potentially be coming in through the back gate if, like, trusty um, inmate workers are involved in in some sort of phone ring, but that has not actually been the way that um, I've been aware of phones getting in in Texas. But then you look at a place like the Bureau of Prisons and federal prisons, and their drone drops are also a common way of getting cell phones in. How does a drone drop work? In the lower security facilities, like the camps and the lows, incarcerated people have enough freedom of movement that they can go out and like retrieve these things. So if somebody, you know, flies their drone of whatever, drops it onto the roof or somewhere onto the prison property. I mean, where exactly you can drop it, again, depends on the property, the amount of surveillance, um, and the extent to which the guards care if they even spot a drone. Because in some places they'll care, and in some places they'll just be like, whatever. If it's a system where people have enough freedom of movement to go outside and retrieve a bag of, you know, materials, they can do that. And that's not something that is easily done in something like a higher security Texas prison. You had an interesting theory that you mentioned to my producer about 
which prisons have have the largest number of illicit phones. I wonder if you could explain that. This is sort of impossible to prove, but just, you know, from the dozens, or I guess probably hundreds at this point of people that I've been in communication with with contraband phones over the years, I sort of think that the prison systems that have the most phones are also the ones that are in the worst shape. For instance, I think Georgia prisons might very well be the worst in the entire country. I know people think Alabama is awful. Alabama is awful. But I think Georgia might actually be worse. And they have incredibly open use of cell phones to a degree that I have not seen in, in other states. Neil do everywhere spider webs. Oh, type of shit, John. And the toilet, and the toilet fucked up, man. Fucked up about a week and a half, two weeks. But this, uh, this do this shit all the time. But then you look at some place like New York or Colorado, where phones are far more rare. Like they exist, they're in some facilities, but they're just not as common as they are in some of the really broken southern prisons. And I think that this is partly because. Some of the same factors that would lead to the introduction of contraband phones also correlate to the same things that make a prison bad. Yeah. Um, specifically, if you don't have a lot of staff, if you're extremely understaffed, living conditions end up being a lot worse. But that also means that that lack of supervision makes it easier to openly use contraband phones. It also decreases the chance that the guards have the time to care. I also think that when you have staff that are, you know, particularly underpaid, which is often the case in many of these Southern prisons, they are more likely to be looking for side money, trying to hustle by smuggling in contraband phones. And they're also less likely to generally care about their jobs. Admittedly, I I don't think there's any real way to sort of study this uh, in, in any definitive way, because you can't really know how many contraband phones are in a system by their very nature. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, I know what some some people tell me. I know that there's people that I've talked to in some prisons that are like, yeah, everybody in this dorm has a phone. Or in some places, they'll be like, yeah, we actually have multiple phones. There's more phones than there are inmates. And then there's other places where it'll be like there's one phone shared among, you know, 100 people or something. Carrie says that just as phone usage varies, the cost of getting one does too. I have heard phones going for as little as two or three hundred bucks, but I think more commonly they're in the like eight hundred to fifteen hundred range. And then on the upper end, it's like three, four, five thousand. Whoa. But yeah, usually I'd say it's in the like eight hundred, twelve hundred range. And we're talking about smartphones, uh, typically not iPhones, but at least smartphones. Although occasionally people will get these these little miniature phones that are not smartphones and are small enough that you can hide them in a body cavity. Those are just not as useful, even if they're easier to, you know, not have confiscated. And where's the money coming from? Like, that doesn't go through a commissary account. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, it varies. Some people are using Cash App, things like that. I mean, some people are trading for them but usually the sort of initial purchase or initial dealings involve needing someone on the outside that can sort of help orchestrate these things although once someone has a contraband phone and can you know access their own money from that phone it becomes a lot easier to to keep it going yeah but there's also the role of gangs in some of the prison systems gangs are a a big force in the contraband phone trade. With gangs, that sort of ensures a a continuity of the contraband flow because it means that there is a structure in place, even if one person leaves. So like maybe the one guy who was really into getting in phones leaves, but there's still a whole gang structure that's in touch with the, you know, whatever corrupt guards are participating and that has access to the money when you're talking about sort of one person on their own just trying to get it, if that person gets transferred or you know their specific contact quits or whatever, then, you know, everybody loses access. 
When we come back, it might seem kind of nuts that a prisoner would make a TikTok for all the world to see, but they're doing it. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcasts, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. I'm thinking about the, the risks for incarcerated people for bringing in a phone, using a phone. I mean, some of the Prison TikToks I've seen have, like, screen names on them, which seems like a a way for someone to track you down if they wanted to. What what are people risking by doing this? So it varies a lot. Um, and the TikToks, by the way, they're just wild to me. Some people are just out there with their entire faces and names, yeah. like, not even trying to hide it. But that's in, like, specific states that, that really don't care. Otherwise, when it comes to sort of what are the consequences, they they vary widely. Some states don't really do a lot. They can't necessarily put people in shoe if they don't have enough shoe space, you know, in solitary, that is. Yeah. Uh, and other places, if you get caught with a cell phone in a federal prison, they have plenty of shoe space. And, you know, they'll transfer you to another prison to, to put you in shoe for months. Uh, they won't typically file criminal charges, although in some states they very much will. I think in a lot of places, when there's enough contraband phones in a system, it becomes a lot harder to discipline people for them because you run out of shoe space and because you can't criminally prosecute every one of these cases or you would overwhelm some of the local DA's offices who do not want to spend all of their local resources prosecuting cell phone cases in prisons. Do do you think it matters what the phones are being used for, whether it's being used for for drug trafficking or whether it's being used for an online course? Like in the eyes of a prison, is that the same thing? I think that currently they don't care. First of all, it's not legal anyway. So in their eyes, you're still breaking the law. It doesn't matter why you're breaking it. But, you know, honestly, even if it were legal, I mean, there's so many ways in which People that run prisons are just sort of programmed to be punitive, often in extreme and unnecessary ways. So even if this were more acceptable, I still don't think that it would matter what people were using it for. Like if Hmm. prison officials can be punitive in many situations, they simply will choose to be. Have you thought at all about where the pandemic fits in this equation. Like I noticed in your piece, oh my God, you talk totally, about this yes. at the beginning of the pandemic, like if if the degree of isolation, you know, from visitors, from family, from loved ones that increased during the pandemic made people want phones more. Well, I also think that because in the early days of the pandemic, in a lot of prisons, they, you know, they locked everyone down. They didn't yeah. have visits. And In a lot of situations, the guards didn't want to do cell searches either because they didn't want to get near the inmates, you know? So I I think that in the first six months or so of the pandemic, it was a lot easier for people to hang on to whatever contraband they had. You know, they just weren't getting cell searches the same way. Or if they were doing cell searches, they just weren't sort of meaningfully actually going through their shit. Especially in, in Texas, for instance, they didn't do cell searches for quite some time. And that meant that people who might have, you know, only been able to keep a contraband phone for a matter of weeks could now keep it for months. 
I also think that in the first few months of the pandemic, it felt really apocalyptic to a lot of people in prison. Yeah. Like they they were looking around at so many people around them either dying or being so sick that it looked like they would die. And I, I think that made a lot of people willing to throw caution to the wind and, you know, start going live on Facebook from in prison or start TikToking, you know, things like that. All of a sudden, out of the blue, fucking everybody just fucking dying and getting sick and shit. Like, this shit serious as fuck. Like, they literally leaving us in here to die. Like, you know, this motherfucker over here dying from corona. They got this motherfucker in my room and shit. Like, just saying, fuck it. Don't care what the consequences are. I think we're all going to die. I want the world to know what's happening. And we did see that. I, I remember in the spring of 2020, I did an article for Vice and the Marshall Project about COVID in federal prisons. And I remember at that time, there were like two or three people that had gone live or posted videos in some capacity from some of the hardest hit federal prisons. And they were just, some of them were just straight up showing their faces. Some made some efforts to disguise themselves. One of them, I think, actually said in in the video that he was just doing this because he was desperate and he needed people to see what was happening. And I, I think that even when people didn't show their faces or didn't go live, that same sort of dynamic played out in a lot of other places. I think that there were a lot of people that started thinking about reaching out to media for the first time or, you know, a, a lot of people that started feeling that they were OK with taking more risks than they might have otherwise. At the same time that contraband smartphones have seemingly become easier to get, prisons are also offering more officially approved technology. But availability and cost vary a lot depending on the state. In Pennsylvania, for example, according to the state, incarcerated people can buy a tablet for $147. They're restricted devices, no Wi-Fi, for example. And using them can be expensive, 25 cents to send an email, $1.80 to buy a song. Some states have ostensibly free tablets, but with similarly high charges from commercial providers to access most of the features. Carrie says that despite the increased availability of prison-issued tablets, a lot of the people she's talked to still prefer contraband phones. There's definitely guys that I've talked to that said despite the initial cost of a phone, it, you know, of a contraband phone, it's, it's still cheaper. There's stupid things you just can't do on most of those prison-issued tablets. Like, it's not like it's just that you can't have raw conversations about your drug dealings. It's also that you cannot, for instance, enroll in an online class at a university of your choice. There's a lot of things you can't do on these tablets. And there are some people who will take those risks even to, to have contraband phones, even for purposes that are entirely positive because they're in solitary where they're in prison for a, a long enough time that they just want something engaging to do. I've noticed that you keep saying guys. Yes. Is this not happening in women's prisons? I have never spoken to someone in a women's prison with a contraband phone. The only woman that I've spoken to was a trans woman who was in a men's prison. And you know, I, I, I think that that's because in general, women just don't get the types and variety of contraband that men do. When I was in prison, uh, which was, you know, 2010 to 2012, I never saw a contraband phone. Now, they admittedly were not as common in general in prison then as they are now. But, you know, there was also a lot less drug contraband, for instance. It existed. Like, there was heroin, but it was not nearly as pervasive as illicit drugs are in most men's units. And, you know, I I think that part of that is because there aren't prison gangs in women's prisons. And I've heard of a few individual units here and there where there is some sort of gang formation in, in women's prisons. But broadly, this is not a thing the way that it is in men's prisons. Hmm. And I, I think that because gangs are, you know, so involved in a lot of the cell phone purchasing and distribution, the lack of gangs is also connected to the sort of lack of contraband or the, you know, relative lack of contraband in 
women's presence. But I also think that part of this is that, you know, w- women are are scared of losing access to their kids. Something like 80 some percent of, of women in prison have kids. And I think that the threat of losing those visits and losing that contact weighs heavily on mothers. And I, I think that also influences their willingness to engage in, you know, that kind of contraband trafficking and trading. When I read your piece, I I was struck by all the different kinds of things that people were doing with phones, whether it was learning or a side hustle or whatever. And it just made me think, like, corrections officials have got to be reading this, too, and thinking about this, too, if it's so widespread. Like, does it ever reach a tipping point where they either, you know, really aggressively crack down or just say like, yeah, there are going to be some ways we make tech more widely available. I mean, maybe the second sentence is ridiculous, but it felt like something that was undeniable. It seems like at some point there's going to have to be some larger reckoning with this. But, you know, given everything we know about how prisons operate, I think that point will come literally years later than it should. (laughs) Whatever whatever the response is. You know, obviously as of now, there's definitely the use of tablets and and email-based communication systems is growing a lot and it's, you know, spreading to a lot more units. But I'm not sure that's really going to quite like fill the gap. You still can't take pictures on those. In, In the instances where you can do some sort of video visit, it's still typically very restricted. And, um, you know, the the access to any sort of internet is so limited. I'm, I'm not sure if, if that will ever be enough to really fill the gap or uh, significantly reduce the demand for contraband phones. So I, I, I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see if there's a point at which officials try to approach this very differently. But as of now, uh, you know, contraband phones are still criminally chargeable. Like, they are still illegal. Before she was a journalist, Carrie served almost two years in New York State on drug charges, from 2010 to 2012. While smartphones were obviously popular then, they weren't as ubiquitous or as cheap as they are now. And one thing I wondered is what it might have meant for her to get to use a phone while she was in prison. Man, I mean, it. you know, I think one of the things that I didn't fully appreciate until afterwards. And this is, I know, kind of niche, but like the the way in which you completely lose touch with uh, like cultural currency during the time you're in, right? Like just ev- think of every single drama that you've seen play out on Twitter or, you know, whatever's trending online. Like we had no awareness of any of that in prison. But there were, you know, entire dramas and controversies and things that people would reference years later that were just a complete black hole for me. And I had no Hmm. idea this major news event happened, you know, or like, I will still, even like 10 years later, occasionally hear a song and be like, oh, that's a cool new song. And then I fucking Google it. And it just came out while I was in prison. It wasn't new. And I know that like that, that lack of cultural awareness, uh, seems really trivial, But I think it's actually hugely important for people who get out because it's really hard to have conversations with people and relate to normal humans when your whole experience is prison and the, you know, the things that could bridge that gap are so limited. You know, I could talk extensively about all the many books I read in prison and that was great for relating to normal people. But like I had no awareness of so many news events or songs, TV shows like I I can't. Talk, I I couldn't talk about like the the latest streaming show or whatever like none of that. I think that's actually really important for reentry. But that's life, right? right? That's the texture of life. That kind of that that fill in the gaps, random stuff. And that's the way that you have like safe, common ground with other people when you get out. Like you can't, you know, be like, oh yeah, I can totally relate to that. That that reminds me of the time my friend stabbed this dude in the mess hall. You know what I mean? But, like, if you have other cultural things in common, like TV shows, like what's happening in the news, like, you know, what's on Twitter, like, whatever, you know, all the, all of these things that help you relate to other people in a, you know, 
normal way, I, I think it makes reentry easier. And maybe cell phones bridge that gap a little bit. Exactly. Carrie Blakinger, it was a pleasure to get to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Carrie Blakinger covers criminal justice for the LA Times. And I really want to recommend her memoir, Corrections in Ink. It's one of the best books I read all year. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Tori Bosch and Mia Armstrong-Lopez. Special thanks to Anna Phillips. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of Audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family, and we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you're a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Like us, rate us, say, hey, listen to this show, and become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening.